Welcome to Key Insights, which is a recap of our symposium, New Directions in Ulcerative Colitis, Evolving Paradigms for Personalized Care. I'm Dr. Bill Sanborn from the University of California, San Diego. With me is Dr. Bruce Sands from the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and Dr. Um, David Rubin from the University of Chicago, and of course, Chicago. Well, guys, we've had an interesting uh, discussion about kind of mechanisms of action and paradigms of care. Um, where shall we start? Bruce, you talked a lot about uh, different mechanisms. There's, of course, a scientific rationale for each of these. But how do we know which ones to pick for which patients? Well, it's a good question, Bill. I think at this point uh, we're, we're going to be faced with many different mechanisms of action, all kinds of different drugs. And uh, we don't have any really good way of selecting an agent for a particular patient. At this point, it's still trial and error. What we'd like is a personalized medicine approach. Um, and we get a hint of that with just one of the agents that I discussed, with, which is etrolizumab. That's an anti-beta-7 integrin antibody. So that also would inhibit alpha-E beta-7 integrin bearing cells, um, as well as alpha-4 beta-7 bearing cells. Now, alpha-E beta-7 is uh, the ligand for E cadherin which brings intraepithelial lymphocytes into the mucosa. Long story short, if you actually measure in the colonic mucosa levels of alpha-E expression, the patients who have high levels of expression actually are much more likely to respond to that particular agent. So this is just one first example of how we might begin to personalize therapy for a given individual patient, choose the right treatment for the patient right off the bat. And there aren't yet uh, placebo-controlled data with either anti-interleukin-1223 or with anti-interleukin-23 antibodies in ulcerative colitis, but there are some data in Crohn's disease, and I seem to recall that you had a biomarker for anti-IL-23 in Crohn's disease as well, or maybe. That's right. Potentially, you know, downstream of IL-23 is IL-22. So in a study with an agent called Medi-2070 that we looked at in patients with Crohn's disease, the patients who had higher than the median level for the population studied of IL-22 in the serum actually had a higher response rate to uh, the agent, which is an anti-P19 antibody, which would block IL-23. So that would be a second example, potentially, of a predictive biomarker, and again, could be used in a personalized medicine approach. We have to say this program was about ulcerative colitis, and thus far uh, no, no anti-IL-23 antibodies have been studied in ulcerative colitis, but we do expect that they should work because we, we know that the genetics tell us uh, that there's a protective polymorphism in the IL-23 receptor. So if you have that polymorphism, uh, you're less likely to have adequate binding of IL-23. So that suggests that the individuals who have blockage of that pathway will actually uh, have decrease of inflammation. So, and this is true for both Crohn's and UC patients. You find the allele in both. In addition to the other mechanisms of action and novel therapies that Bruce mentioned, I also want to mention tofacitinib, which inhibits the JAK kinase pathway. Tofacitinib, as you know, had two pivotal trials for induction of moderate to severe ulcerative colitis that were positive, and more recently, their maintenance data looked positive as well. So we're enthusiastic about incorporating this agent, which is not a biologic, another small molecule, into our algorithms for ulcerative colitis. By having a small molecule, we don't have to worry about the immunogenicity. So when we think about individualizing care for patients with ulcerative colitis, we can also be thinking about how we might use a small molecule at different places in the algorithm. And David, I always make the point to the fellows that I train that the first rule of personalized medicine is to personalize the dose. Um, how do you, what do you think about that therapeutic drug monitoring? Is that part of personalized medicine? Well, we talked about that, uh, and I think that that's absolutely part of it because in the absence of understanding or predicting clearance before you dose, which hopefully we'll get to, the next thing to do is to look at where the drug level might be after you've already started so that you can be um, proactive in adjusting dosing. So I shared some data in ulcerative colitis from the pivotal ACT-1 and ACT-2 trials in moderate to severe outpatients with UC where infliximab was administered and we learned that looking at the highest levels of trough of infliximab as early as week 8 after loading predicted the likelihood of continuing to respond by weeks 30 and 54. 
So the implication is that you could start using this clinically with the idea of adjusting your dose early before the patient loses response or doesn't respond and keep them well throughout their course of management. And a, another way of personalizing um, therapy is to prognosticate and choose uh, relatively less expensive, less toxic, easier to take drugs for patients with a good prognosis and pull out all the stops for bad prognosis. Do, what do you think about that as a personalized strategy and what, are, what would be some examples in ulcerative colitis? Well, I think that uh, first of all, what we need to understand really is how sick the individual patient is, not just sitting in front of you now, but what their prognosis might be. And we have more information about that that's been useful in Crohn's. But the reality is that we certainly know about some UC patients who are likely to have progression over time or who've been living with active disease for a long time where they're at risk for higher uh, complications like neoplasia or even surgery. So understanding such things as how the endoscopic appearance looks uh, and how the patient responds when you initially give them uh, 5 ASA therapy is important because you don't want to spend too much time on a therapy that isn't doing what you need it to do. So one way to sort of adjust for the lack of biomarkers is to look at whether or not the bowel is healing at a certain time. Don't wait for the patient to be suffering and suffer a complication before you decide you're going to move on to another therapy. We've learned that mucosal healing in UC especially, but also in Crohn's, um, is, results in favorable outcomes. And I showed that in uh, a, a more recent study of 5-ASA where patients did better over time, and we know that's true in general. So I suggest that when you start a patient on therapy, the personalized approach to it is how are you going to follow up early so that you can make a decision and adjust rather than just waiting to see what happens or until they call your office. Bruce, uh, during the symposium, uh, David talked about using uh, cyclosporin in some patients with severe ulcerative colitis and fliximab in others. Um, certainly we do therapeutic drug monitoring with, if we use cyclosporin. Are you also doing therapeutic drug monitoring for infliximab in the hospital? And you know, how do you, how do you choose between those two drugs? And what, what's the approach to the the personalized approach to the severely ill hospitalized patient? Yeah, we we certainly do sometimes still use cyclosporin at Mount Sinai where I practice, um, and we would generally reserve it for someone who has um, had prior experience with a TNF blocker. Although not recently, I'm not a fan of stacking one immune suppressing medication on another close on the heels of each other because I think there is demonstrable toxicity and risk of infections that can be quite serious. So, but for those patients who have had some separation of that of time, if they've already had infliximab, that would be an equally good choice. Um, but they have to have adequate cholesterol levels in order for them to safely get cyclosporine. A lot of the patients would be predicted to be non-responsive or require excessively high doses of infliximab um, because they have a low albumin would also have a low cholesterol. So it becomes very difficult. You know, the CISIF study shows that on average, um, as initial therapy for the severe hospitalized UC patient, um, it probably doesn't matter whether you choose cyclosporine or infliximab. So you can probably choose whatever, whatever uh, you feel most comfortable with. If you do choose cyclosporin, that's only going to be an inductive therapy, though you still have to keep in mind that the patient will need to be on something after that. Historically, that's been a thiopurine, uh, but could be other things these days, potentially even vetalizumab or maybe an anti-TNF later on. Um, and you asked about monitoring of levels uh, in the severe hospitalized UC patient. The problem is the turnaround time for those levels are okay. too long to be really useful in the day-to-day -day management of those very severely ill patients. So what we've come to do is really work by monitoring the CRP very closely, and we'd like to see a real decrease in the CRP very quickly after an infusion of infliximab. And if we don't, we might stack the doses early to get them there. I, I agree with everything you said, Bruce. <clears throat> and I just want to point out that uh, too often these really sick patients who start to turn the corner are discharged from the hospital and then people don't pay attention to the details necessary to keep them well. Because even the CISIF study, which initially just looked at getting them out of the hospital with their colons intact, didn't really provide us that much information about longer term management. Then we saw some follow up. So whomever the patient is that's in the hospital and really sick, whatever you do and they start to respond or they do well, you want to make sure you have a good plan and you stay on top of them 
vigorously uh, after they leave so that you can try to keep them there and you don't lose track. Yeah, and it, it's an especially complex ballet with cyclosporin monitoring levels, monitoring cholesterol, monitoring blood pressure, sure. monitoring kidney function, transitioning to the thiopurine, tapering the steroids. So it is becoming Prophylaxing much, for pneumocystis. Yes, that so. too. And so it's a lot easier treating with infliximab in I, that situation. I agree with everything that was said. I, I'll give you an example, though, where, where, where we can think about all this. We had a patient who was a secondary loss of response to infliximab um, and developed severe colitis, uh, ordered a drug level, but he got sicker and was in the hospital. So the drug level came back just because of the timing, right, when we admitted him and he had uh, undetectable drug with the antibodies. But at this point, he was in the hospital sick and he was IV steroid resistant. So we went to cyclosporin and used that as a bridge to vetalizumab. In this case, we knew that at least his serum infliximab level was zero and presumably he wasn't at risk for that stacking effect, which we do worry about. So you can think about that's a personalized approach and that was a success story that we then described and published. But that's not for everybody, I completely agree. It's just a way to think though about the individual patient here. So let's take that that exact same scenario, but ratchet it down just a little. So they're not uh, failing IV steroids in the hospital, but they're on, you know, they have 15 stools a day as an outpatient. Uh, they're not a, maybe they're not anemic, but they're you know fairly sick, and they've already uh, failed uh, two TNF blockers. And you want to use vetalizumab. What do you do besides just do the vetalizumab to optimize all of that? Well, it's a challenge. Um, Although I think vetalizumab as a standalone inductive agent works when we need it to, the reality is that this is a patient who, did you say they have antibodies against their TNFs or yeah. they just lost response? Let's say antibodies. So although we don't have the data to necessarily inform us as much as we'd like, you worry that this is an immunogenic patient and that their likelihood of having the same problem with the next monoclonal antibody, even vetalizumab as a different mechanism, might be similarly high. So in that situation, I probably would be using steroids and a concomitant immunomodulator, and, and I like to use methotrexate even in UC if I'm using it for that purpose, and vetalizumab together and really do the best I can and then withdraw the steroids. And how long will you go before you call it a day? On the vetalizumab? Yeah. Um, if they're not responding after their first maintenance dose, I'm not that enthusiastic that I'm gonna get them anywhere, but at this symposium I presented the subset from Gemini 1 who were allowed to get monthly vetalizumab for a few months and they picked up a small number of patients. So if the patient's improving but not in remission, I will go to monthly infusions and give them three more months to show me what they're gonna do, but I won't go longer than that. So by six months, if they haven't been steadily improving and getting where I need them, I'm gonna to have to move on to something else. And now that you, there are two commercial assays for vetalizumab, would you actually measure that in the context of? I've started doing that now. Going and to I monthly know, dosing? Yeah, people are asking questions about how to interpret it. I'm, I think we're still trying to sort some of this out. I often say that the most informative level to me would be a zero level, certainly. Or a low level. Um, or something that was less than five, perhaps. But uh, otherwise, I'm not sure what to interpret anything above that. And in those situations, I likely would still push the dose and try to get them better with that. And what, Bruce, what about going down to the kind of mild to moderate patient? Um, you know, we have budesonide foam now. We have the historic, uh, you know, hydrocortisone enemas. We've got mesalamine rectal therapies. You, now you've got MMX budesonide and you've got all the oral mesalamines. How do you mix and match uh, that for the mild to moderate patient? Yeah, all those, all those uh, drugs have their place for the mild to moderate patient. I think it's important to keep in mind that a lot of the symptoms uh, may be driven by the rectal inflammation, the tenesmus and the urgency that really bothers most patients. So there I really like to, even if, if I'm giving a more broadly expansive delivery of a medication, I may still deliver topical rectally. And uh, but, uh, budesonide foam is a nice way of doing that. It's well tolerated. The volume is low. It adheres to the mucosa in theory. Um, enemas are, are great. Um, historically, uh, meta-analyses have shown that 5-ASA enemas are probably better than steroid enemas in terms of efficacy. Uh, we know that even for patients with extensive colitis, when you add a topical, there is greater symptomatic relief. But I think regardless, it's important to keep in mind that the goal is not just relief of symptoms, it's also to make sure that the mucosa really heals up. And that means looking in, 
and maybe even biopsying increasingly I think we're all coming to believe that histology is really what has to heal up if the patient's truly going to remain well. I'll finish by asking each of you for any last pearls about personalizing therapy of ulcerative colitis. David, we can start with you. Sure. Uh, I think that understanding the individual patient and how the disease is affecting their lifestyle is the first step here in terms of are they able to function. So you can try to decide early how quickly you need to be acting on all of this. But then uh, I want to emphasize that whatever therapy you use, uh, evaluating your progress at a scheduled interval that's short is critical so that you can move through and find whatever therapy is going to work. So it's personalized medicine by looking at the downstream benefit of your therapy, uh, which we call treat to target, really. Uh, that's the way I think about doing this, and that's the message for our colleagues. Bruce, last word? Yeah, I completely agree with what David said. And what I often think of is that this treat to target um, approach is simply being attentive to the patient and their needs in a very direct way. And it is really one of the pleasures of the care of IBD patients is getting to know them and caring for them over the long haul. And there we have it, key insights from Orlando, Florida. Thank you for your attention.